I'm very pleased to be able to introduce to you Scott Malky from HP Labs. Scott got his dissertation from the University of Illinois in Wenmei Who's Group, Compiler and Architecture Group. There he was Mr. Predicated Execution. This is a style of architecture that has been uh, totally embraced by Intel and their i864 processor and in some part for, by every other chip manufacturer. Since he's been at HP, he's shifted gears somewhat. He's now, instead of uh, software compiling, he's hardware compiling, uh, in particular for ASICs, and this is what he's going to talk about today with us. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here. And yeah, the title of the talk is uh, Compiler-Directed Synthesis of Hardware Accelerators. And as uh, Susan mentioned, it's, it's, it's essentially hardware compilation. So, so what I'm going to talk about uh, kind of an overview of the talk is I'm going to start off and I'm going to give you kind of a really high level description of what the project is at HP Labs, what we're doing, what we're trying, to, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. And I'm going to do a lot of hand waving for this red part, uh, so kind of bear with me, but I, I kind of just want to give you a flavor of what we're doing and what's going on. And then for the second half of the talk, I'm going to switch gears and kind of, kind of look under the hood for one part of the, one part of the tool that we're designing. So how do we do, how do we essentially design high quality, uh, hardware accelerators by examining the width, the variable, the width of the data contained within the variables. So how do we analyze the width to produce essentially uh, narrow hardware, more cost effective hardware? And then I'll conclude with some summary and final thoughts. Uh, if you have questions, please, please interrupt me at any point. I mean, uh, don't let me go on if you're, you're confused and stuff. So, you know, st stepping back, looking at the uh, history of the computer industry for the last 40 years. Um, we started up with, you know, the, the, the first major thing was mainframes, then mini computers, uh, then workstations, then PCs. And kind of the, the, the general trend is that, you know, we've been um, exposing meaningful computation to end users at a fraction of the price. So basically each generation, the, the, the cost of doing computation went down by an order of magnitude. And also the number, because the cost has went down, the number of people able to use these devices has also gone up by that same order of magnitude. So during this process, I mean, mainframes, which are pretty difficult to use, now we've, now we've gotten into a PC where pretty much every person in business has a PC on their desk, everyone from the engineer to the secretary. And the, the question is, you know, what's the next step? Is there a next step? So is the PC kind of the end of computer architecture, or is there, or is there a new generation that's going to kind of take over the center of computer architecture beyond the PC? So. We at HP Labs believe that the, uh, the, the, next, uh, the next centerpiece for computer architecture is, inv is invisible or embedded computers. And what an invisible <coughs> or embedded computer is, is essentially a computer that you don't really think of as being a computer. So a PC, you know, you're at your, you're at your desk typing, you're, you're either doing uh, you know, document preparation, you're writing a C program, you really know it's a computer. Whereas an invisible computer, it's really like a cellular phone or something that you're using, and you're using it for some special purpose, and there's some hidden computing going on underneath it, but you're not really aware of what the computing is. So, I mean, we believe, I mean, these things already exist, and we believe that the center of gravity for computer architecture will kind of be in this invisible computing arena when, you know, the number of such devices is, is 10 to 100 times uh, the, number of, the number of PCs. So we're, we're moving in that direction, but we're not quite there yet as far as the center of gravity goes. So, you know, what, what, is, what, is, what do these invisible computing uh, things look like? So it's basically two layers. On the top layer, which is the layer that the user sees, it's a smart product. And then underneath that is some embedded computing that's doing all the computation required for the smart product. So from HP's perspective, you know, it's the, you know, printers and, and test and measurement is kind of where the action's at. So things like oscilloscopes, uh, your laser printer, these are the things that they're focused on. So they're focused, so what we're looking at is the, uh, the computing power that goes inside these devices. Now other big things, I mean, you have digital cameras, you have cellular telephones, uh, Palm Pilots, uh, automobiles is a big thing nowadays, that these are essentially going to be the, the computers on wheels and, you know, they're going to give you all this information as you drive your car. So voice recognition, all kinds of things are going to go into these devices. So, uh, yeah, so one kind of characteristic of these embedded computer systems is they're very diverse. So the, the, the computation requirements for, say, a printer may be quite different from an automobile or quite different from a cellular telephone. So the diversity in embedded computer systems is a big, is a big thing that uh, I'm going to focus on today. So, you know, what, what are the challenges with embedded computing systems and, and computer architecture in embedded computing systems? 
the first thing, there, there's really two broad categories, design and economic. So on the design side, how do we, how do we design uh, a set of diverse uh, custom designs for these specific applications? So if I have a cellular telephone, I'm going to want one set of computing requirements. If I have a printer, I'm going to want another set. And these are going to be very different in the way they look. <coughs> another thing is the, um, you know, along the same lines, the, the number of distinct designs. So if you think of like a PC, there's a few, there's a few PCs out there. There's like a Spark architecture, there's a Pentium architecture, there's maybe PA RISC. There's basically maybe 10 architectures that you can think of, 10 to 20. Whereas we believe that in the embedded computing world, this, this number is going to increase dramatically, up to 100 or order of 1,000. So there's going to be many different designs out there, and the ability to crank out such designs I is a major challenge. Another thing is, you know, it's kind of whoever gets there first defines the market. So designing something fast is, is, is becoming increasingly important. Um, on the performance side, I mean, when you think of embedded computer systems, you kind of think of this 8-bit microcontroller, which is not really executing a whole lot of stuff. But, you know, that's only part of embedded computing. I mean, there's other parts where the performance is, is, is very important. <coughs> so if you think of, like, printing, I mean, image processing is a very compute-intensive uh, thing. And it, actually, if you, if you try to run some of the applications that we've been looking at on a Pentium processor, they won't, they won't run fast enough. So a big thing is, you know, how do we design cheap but also high-performance uh, uh, embedded, embedded processors? Uh, system on a chip, so it's no longer, you know, it's just the processor that you're worried about. You're really worried about the entire, the, you know, the processor, the coprocessors, the I.O. system, the memory. These are all are going to go together, so it's really you're trying to produce a, a, a system level solution versus a, a point level solution. Now, in addition, the, on the economic side, you know, if, if we think of the PC world, there, you know, a, a PC processor, you know, costs on the order of hundreds or thousands of dollars. So individual dollars aren't, aren't as important. Whereas in the embedded side, you know, you're trying to sell, you know, a uh, $100 printer or you're trying to sell, you know, a $200 digital camera. It's, it's really, you know, the, the dollars matter. So if you can produce a design that's cheaper or that indirectly saves costs, so for example, maybe it needs a smaller fan or a smaller heat sink. Anything that you can do to reduce cost is, is something that these people are looking for. Um, the next two points kind of go together. I mean, uh, you know, PCs are kind of recycled on the order of, on the order of years. So basically, you, you get a new generation of your, of your Pentium about every year. Whereas we believe on the uh, embedded computer side, you know, we're going to get new versions of, of printers and digital cameras much faster. So on the order of, so architectures are only going to be around for on the order of months. So, you know, shorter product cycles and, you know, each design is only going to have a, is going to have a smaller number of units. So, this, there's, there's less time to amortize your, your design costs. So you really need to focus on doing, doing cheap designs. Yeah, question? One of the things that short design cycles that will change so much that will demand a different architecture, right? I mean, from printer to printer, is it, I mean, the performance demands that different places? Yeah, it, it's basically the, the uh, rapid development of the technology. So like the printer side is, you know, how do you, how do you get closer and closer to photographs and quality images, for example? So basically the, the, the the underlying technology is evolving so fast that they basically just want to roll out printers to take advantage of this new technology to essentially get a better quality. They're, they're trying to get better quality images. So the old, I mean, the old printers are out of date very fast, uh, even compared to the, I mean, PC, it's kind of, you buy one, you know, as soon as you buy it, it's out of date, but a, a, a printer's even worse than that. So uh, there was another question over here. Or? of all this is that, um, you know, the combination of these challenges, we believe, is going to force some degree of automation into the process. So unless you can automate some of the process, you're not going to be able to meet both of these requirements, either or both of these requirements. So the project at HP Labs is called PICO. And PICO is essentially, you can think of it, it's essentially a black box in which the, your input is a program. So program in, that's where the PI comes from. So this is like a C program. And then what you want to produce, you want to have this black box produce essentially a chip on the, on the output side. You want a custom piece of hardware that can run that program that's on your input side. So program in, chip out uh, is where the acronym comes from. So what is this black box? I mean, this black box is essentially an uh, automatic synthesis tool to create custom uh, microprocessors and the compiler to go with the microprocessor or a custom coprocessor. So it's trying to, it's trying to produce an application-specific design for a particular application, give me a, a, a specialized piece of hardware to run that piece of code very well. So what it's trying to do is this, you know, what 
what software compilers kind of did for uh, programming. So many people can, in the old days where you had to program assembly code, you kind of needed a specialized person to, to develop software. Now we've kind of introduced these compilers so that many more people can, can write, can, can do coding. Same thing on the hardware side. I mean, now, you know, right now it takes a, a team of specialized engineers to go design a processor or a hardware accelerator. What we want to do is introduce automated tools so that essentially more and more people can get involved in this process. And you don't need a specialized team of people. Like, you don't have to always go to Intel to, to uh, get this done for you. So, you know, how does this system all work? I mean, the way, the way that, we, um, that we're going to do automated design is we're going to target what we call a stylized architecture or a meta architecture. And the meta architecture has two, two major components. So the first component is just your, your kind of your, re, your configurable core processor. So this is just a VLIW processor where you can specify the number of integer units, the number of floating point units, the number of registers, et cetera. So this is essentially like an off-the-shelf TI or MIPS processor, but it has some customization capability. That the, the system is allowed to customize this to a certain extent. Now for, the fo for, the, for this talk, I'm going to focus on the right-hand side here, which is our hardware accelerator. So essentially what you're going to do is you're going to take your application. 90% of your application is going to be compiled and run on the, the core processor. The remaining 10%, which is kind of the computation intensive part, you're going to create a special purpose coprocessor, and that, co and that coprocessor is going to run that 10% of the code. Um, so, you know, what does this coprocessor look like? So essentially it's a, it's a um, synchronous set of parallel processors. So, and each of these processors, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the design very simple. So we're, the control, it's, it's mainly a, a, a set of uh, hardwired data pads with minimal control. So what, we've, what we're going to do, and I'm going to go over this design process a little bit more, we're going to make most of the control for, this, for the data pass explicit in the code. And then the remaining control, which is essentially just the loop control, so counting down how many iterations you have, counting down when should I start a new loop iteration, that's going to be the remaining control. But the, pr the majority of this is just uh, data path, register, and interconnect. So we're trying to essentially create as low a cost design as we can by restricting it to you know, just the necessary components. Now, these two, these two major components are connected through just your standard memory hierarchy, two-level cache, followed by main memory. And for this talk, like I said, I'm going to assume that the left-hand side is just a off-the-shelf component. So we're going to focus on this, this right-hand side design. So what does this design system look like? <coughs> so as I said, or as I haven't said, but I will say now, we start with a C loop nest. So this is just an n-dimensional perfect uh, loop nest. Uh, with, with statements inside the loop. Now the manager of this whole process is what we call the spacewalker. So this is an iterative design process. So essentially what you're going to do is you're going to pick a design point, you're going to go through and evaluate, take some feedback, pick another design point, and kind of repeat until you either get tired of waiting or it, it's exhausted all the possibilities. So what we're trying to produce is what we call a Pareto chart. So a Pareto chart is just a, uh, a plot of the points, and it's, a, it's, it's performance versus area, performance versus cost. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to identify the red points. So the red points are the points that are either better than any other point. And for a given performance, they're the smallest area to achieve that performance. Or for a given area, this is the most performance you can get. So basically, you're, you're selecting, you know, the red, po the red points assume any points out in this space because they're either, the red point is either less hardware or more performance or both. So the system is trying to identify these red points on the periphery of the curve. And then these are the points, these are essentially the best designs that the user is going to pick from. Okay, so how does the system work? So, you know, you kind of come, come down these uh, red boxes. And what a lot of this looks like is it looks like compilation. So you do things like you do flow analysis, you do tiling, you do iteration scheduling, uh, you do some optimizations, loop transform, operations. So it looks a lot like a compiler. But the difference is, is that it's not a fixed piece of hardware. So instead of compiling to, say, a Pentium processor, the hardware is evolving as you go. So you're compiling to this meta architecture, but all the parameters in the meta architecture haven't been defined. After you essentially, after you, Can I ask one question? yeah, sure. It seems like there's other criteria though besides just the uh, area of speed. For example, yield or mm -hmm. adaptability to new uh, products or things like that. So That's right. This seems as hot power as other ones. Yeah, hot yeah. power, exactly. So isn't, isn't this too simple? I think for kind of the current things we're looking at, we, we performance versus area were kind of the two top things. 
where the other things were kind of important, but you know, lower down in the point of view. But I think, yeah, to generalize, you definitely need to expand. I mean, this, this essentially should become, you know, this could have n dimensions, where all these things matter. Uh, I would say, you know, the next thing is probably power, in, in my opinion, is the next most important thing. But I, I think the things that you mentioned are also uh, important as well. But, but right now, they, just because, um, you know, they, they weren't top on the priority list for the, for the groups we were talking to, that, that's why they were made secondary, so, but I agree with you. So, yes? Are you anticipating a vanilla piece of code that was written intended for sequential processors and then extract out accelerators, or is there some way that someone's going to write in a more parallel form or a form more targeted to the hardware for the stuff that you're going to pull out? Uh, I'm going to go over an example in a couple of slides, but kind of just a general answer to the question. We're, we're mainly taking a, a sequential piece of C code and then converting it into a parallel form to map to the hardware. Um, this is okay for a single loop nest to a single accelerator. As soon as you get into a bunch of loop nests and to a bunch of accelerators, then you may need to have some more concurrent semantics. But so, so far, it, it, it's been all right for what we've done so far. But uh, that's kind of the future of where we're going. It's a more concurrent uh, programming language. So. so once you've kind of scheduled, so you can think of the, this, this part of the, the, the process is essentially a, at the statement level and iteration level. So this is kind of like a very high level compiler. You drop down to assembly code and you do operation scheduling. And then basically what we do is we synthesize the hardware. So you essentially, you have a component library consisting of things like adders, registers, wires, and you basically just assemble these components according to the operation schedule. And that, that's how you produce your hardware. And then from that you can esti et estimate the, uh, the area it takes to, to, to realize that hardware. And then essentially, like I said, there's a feedback loop. So this thing, you know, what were, the, what were some of the characteristics of this design? What, what, what could be changed to produce a better design? So that's fed back to the spacewalker. The spacewalker picks another point, repeats the process. So like I said, I'm gonna go over the, the steps in that picture a little bit more now. Um, so kind of getting into the, so the front end has two major things which it's responsible for. Uh, the first thing is, the, is managing the memory bandwidth. So we, we, we assume that the uh, memory bandwidth is gonna be one of our major limiting factors. So we wanna maximize the computation to memory uh, ratio for our application. So let me first, before I get into what we do there, let me start with what our input language is. And my colleague calls it uh, C plus minus. So it's essentially C with a bunch of restrictions and a few generalizations uh, uh, is our input language. So first on the restriction side, um, we need to be able to do uh, complete dependence analysis for all the uh, memory accesses uh, in the loop. So we, we need to assume that the array indices are well behaved. Uh, we, also, we also need to assume that there's no uh, use of pointers. The one exception is that if you have a read-only array, which is really a lookup table, then you can access it any way you want. But any kind of read-write array has very uh, restrict or restricted uh, forms that it can be accessed. On, the, on the, the C plus side, what we've added is we've added some user fragments. So essentially we're, we're allowed to specify 13-bit integers, for example, or we're able to differentiate local versus global uh, memory accesses. So the pragmas are essentially just, um, C is not a very good hardware description language. So these are kind of the at least level one things that we, we found that we definitely needed to add to C in order to make it uh, uh, work for our system. <coughs> okay, so like I said, the, the first thing that the, the system is trying to do is work on the memory bandwidth. So we start with, you know, a simple C loop, you know, perfect loop nest with some statements inside the loop. And this one's just doing a simple increment of Y sub I. Uh, it's, it's really a dot product. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do two things. So we're gonna do full load store elimination. So what full load store elimination means is that we're going to, anytime the, an array value is read first, we're gonna go to global memory and we're gonna read it. Every time after that, we're gonna keep it internally and get the value from internal storage. So in this notation, the lowercase array names refer to a, an access to global memory. The uppercase array names refer to accesses to local space. So what we essentially do is you can see that the W element, the first time you execute I, all the J's go through and read in all the W's. The next iteration of I, all the W's are already in local space or have already been read. So we're gonna get them from our internal local space. So essentially that's what this statement's doing. It's saying if I is greater than one, get W, from an internal storage location. Otherwise, go out to global memory and get the W. Now, if you do this kind of 
for the original loop nest, if you, if you just do this blindly, you're going to have tons of internal storage. And it, it, the internal storage is just gonna kill, the cost is gonna kill you. So what we do then to reduce that is we tile the loop. So essentially, instead of focusing on the whole uh, uh, um, index space, we're gonna focus on small blocks of it. And therefore, we can reduce the amount of internal storage that's required. So we're gonna tile this loop nest. So that's essentially what this extra level of loop, the, the J loop. So essentially, this walks the tile, the outer J loop, and then the inner J loop within a tile, it walks the various uh, data points within that tile. So essentially, by breaking down the iteration space, we reduce the amount of uh, internal local storage that is required. <coughs> so the, the other major thing that the front end is responsible for is it's responsible for handling which iterations execute on which processor. So I mentioned that it's a, it's a, there's, it's a synchronous set of processors that are gonna operate on this data. So which processors execute which data, or which, pro, which processors execute which iterations and at what time? So starting with our loop from the, the previous slide, so we have our I, we have our J tiling loop, and we have our, our J loop. What we're gonna do is we're gonna convert this, you know, IJ loop into what, what we call a TP loop. So T stands for time, P stands for processor. So essentially the, the, the P loop is a parallel loop. You know, both of these processes are executing uh, uh, at the same time. And T is, you know, time equals zero, time equals one, time equals two. So this is the thing that you're just sequentially stepping through. So after transformation, that's what, uh, this is what we, we get. And the, the thing I wanna bring out in this code is that the, I mentioned that the control and the communication is made explicit within the code so that we don't have to, we've essentially made the control be data. So we have to make the, the control explicit within the code as data. So for example, if we look at this X loop, what this is saying is that my current value of X, if this condition is held, is gonna come from a local, a local X generated four cycles ago from my neighboring processor, or else I'm gonna go to global memory. Similarly, the W, I'm gonna get the current W from, the fi from a five cycles ago uh, production on the same processor, so that's just P. So essentially, where the data's coming from and where it's going to is explicit in the code so that we don't need external, it's, we're just gonna have data paths when we get done, and we're not gonna have a lot of external control to, to uh, decide when iterations are executed and when, uh, where, where values are coming from. Okay, so like I said, I'm, I'm trying to give you a high level picture and I'm, I'm doing a lot of hand waving on purpose so that you can kind of get the whole picture and, but not a lot of details of each, of, of each part of the system. So, the front end is essentially, like I said, a, a loop level and a statement level uh, compiler. Now we're gonna convert down to assembly code and, and synthesize real hardware. So we start with our, our, loop, our, our loop nest. We convert to assembly code and we do some traditional optimizations. Uh, we do if conversion to remove all the control flow. So essentially we're gonna just be left with sequential uh, operations. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna, build, we're gonna build what we call a wide SP. So what we wanna do is we wanna schedule the code to a machine, a machine that doesn't exist yet. So what we're gonna do, and we only know how to schedule to very regular machines. So we're gonna try to software pipeline this loop. But software pipelining to some very sparse, where only certain things are connected to one another, is very difficult. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build, build this hypothetical wide SP. This wide SP is gonna have some number of function units, and I'm gonna go over this with an example uh, in a few slides. It has a number of function units, and every function unit can talk to every other function unit. So we're gonna, we're gonna Create this thing that we, do, we don't want to build this thing. So we're essentially going to create this wide, wide uh, systolic processor. We're going to schedule to this machine. Then after we schedule, we're going to get rid of everything that we didn't use. So if this function unit only talked to this one, we'll keep that one. But all the wires to the other function units, we're going to get rid of. So that's essentially what this is saying. So we essentially, we schedule the code to the wide processor, the hypothetical processor. We get rid of everything we don't need. And then we build the custom data path based on the, the pruned down uh, wide SP. So let me go through that kind of a little pictorially now. So we start with an assembly level loop. So essentially all these green ovals are, operation, are assembly level operations. So you have like loads, you have adds, you have multiplies, things like that. The arrows between the, the, the green ovals are essentially who talks to who. So who provides the value to, to which other operation. So this is the data flow essentially. And each of these edges has a certain latency associated with it. So an add may take uh, you know, in this example, an add takes one cycle, a multiply takes three cycles. So all these things are gonna have uh, uh, latencies associated with them. The, the uh, kind of uh, circular edges are essentially loop carry dependence, dependencies. So this select is essentially getting its input from either the load, the load operation or the value produced by the select two iterations ago. So what these 
uh, cycle, cyclic edges are, are essentially saying is that I'm gonna need some buffer. If I need the value two, two iterations ago, I'm gonna have to store up some, iteration, some values in order to, to get the, the second iteration. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna build this wide SP. So a wide SP is essentially a fully connected VLIW processor. So for this case, I've decided that I'm gonna initiate a new loop iteration every cycle. So this means for every one of those green ovals on the previous slide, I need a function unit, one of these pink, pink, pink rectangles to, to execute that operation. So essentially I create, for every, for every green oval on the previous slide, I create a pink box on this slide. And then it's a fully connected thing, so every pink box is connected to every other pink box. So I know how to, so this is a very regular architecture and it's easy to schedule to. So I'm gonna map that green, that green graph to this architecture. So you schedule the code and now you're gonna remove everything that didn't, that didn't get used. So if this load only talked to this store, then I can remove all connections from other function units that, that weren't used. So then you get rid of all the connections that weren't used. These blue uh, squares, these are, these are essentially shift registers. So those loop carry dependencies, I need to buffer up results from, because I, I want the value from two iterations ago, three iterations ago. So I need some buffer to hold up, to, to buffer up the, these intermediate values. So that's what the blue uh, squares are. So then when we synthesize the customized processor, this is the kind of thing we end up with. So you can see that it's, 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 a, it's, it's a pretty simple thing. I mean, there's, there's adders, there's multipliers, there's muxes, the, all these blue uh, rectangles are, are registers. So these are, so this is just a, a shift register to hold up uh, values from previous loop iterations. So, so it's a very simple thing. So this is kind of a example of, for that original piece of C code that I showed you, this is one processor in the array that, that would get uh, synthesized. Okay, so I'm done with hand-waving for a while. Oh no, I'm not done with hand-waving. <laughs> Arbitrarily wide hardware fully connected, and then you eliminate those hardware components that you're not actually using. Yes. Meaning that you leave hardware components that you have at least used once. But that, that doesn't say anything about how frequently you use it. And I can imagine that it might be better to eliminate infrequently used components and take the hit in time yes. in some way. How, yes. do you, how do you manage that? How do you account for that? Yes, yeah, so right now what, what we're doing is we're assuming we're assuming that the the performance is fixed. So I'm not allowed to delay anything. So if I used a, a component one one hundredth of the time, I still require it. So, so right now we're not, we're not doing what you mentioned. But I think that's a, uh, so there's really two things. I mean, one is trying to do smarter, you know, try to make things highly utilized. So do it more intelligent now. Instead of just kind of, we're kind of in a situation where however it falls out, whatever we don't end up using, we get rid of it. But you can do a smarter job of saying, you know, I'm gonna try to use this one as much as I can, and maybe I won't need this other guy. So we haven't, that, that's a subject of future work, really. Uh, we haven't really gotten into, uh, we do have kind of a greedy, a greedy system so that if, you know, if you, if you only need uh, one adder, all the ads could go to this adder, we will do that. We won't artificially put them on, you know, two, three, four, five. So we do try to kind of greedily maxim, you know, always, re, always reuse a resource that already exists but you, there's still a lot of room to do it smarter. So, uh, and that we're not doing right now, so. Someone else have a question or? Yeah, in the back. Will the processors end up looking the same? Yes, that's right. Yeah, so if you, if you had two of these things, you just replicate this thing twice and then hook up the appropriate connections. Another question? Yes. Uh, Sorry, I, see. I have a question about the, how the space walker okay. works. Yes. Um, so it seems like what you presented is sort of one one attempt at designing the hardware for the input loop. Uh, how do you decide, how does the feedback control work to move around in different parts of the design space? It seems like Susan's question uh, could be addressed by being able to move around and choose designs that didn't have that extra piece of hardware. But I'm not sure how, how you control that. Right, so what, right now what the design space is really doing is it's really, there's really two levels. One is if something failed, so maybe you, you, you were scheduling your, your code and you didn't have enough function. So if something fails, then it definitely will increase, say, a number of function units or something else to correct that failure. That's kind of at the, at the inner level. At the outer level, it's really trying 
you know, do I have one processor that, iter that initiates a loop iteration every cycle? Do I have two processors that initiate an iteration every two cycles? So it's essentially just exploring different ways, different configurations to achieve the same performance. Previous designs would work to, this, to decide should you try additional processors or make other kinds of uh, motions in the design space? There is a there is a feedback path. However, right now the, the model feedback is very minimal in what it provides. It basically it, it basically lets you know was the last point a variable point or was the last point a non variable point. But you can almost think of it at this point that the space walker is essentially uh, trying all possible. In our DLIW design space, what we do is we actually feedback. Um, so this is on the design of the core processor. What was what was essentially the bottleneck? So what's what's adder to my vault, my model? If adder was vault, bottleneck, what you do is you use the feedback. Okay, next design, we increase the number of adders by one. So in the co the co processor space walker is kind of stupid in that it's almost a a you know walk everything that exists. The VLIW spacewalker is more intelligent in that it's trying to identify what was the critical limiting resource, and please increase that for your next design to hopefully get a better design point. So, so you're only just improving the greatest bottleneck. So, so yeah, it's not a gradient in terms of all the possible things you could be changing in one time, but more just the, the very specific one that's the greatest bottleneck. Uh, yes, with the with the the space worker, at least for the systolic side, isn't 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 uh, focused on the internals too much. It's more focused on the macro view of things. So, how many processors do I have? What is their shape? Uh, how often do they start the new iteration? So it's really focused on the more macro view of what the world is. And then internally, it's assumed that the the system is going to produce the uh, best design possible. And if, and if anything fails, there's an there's an internal space walk loop that increases units in order to prevent a failure. OK, so you guys have kind of survived the hand-waving part. And now, now let me jump into the, uh, a little more details and kind of try to give you a flavor of what, what this thing really looks like and what we're doing uh, inside the Pico tool. So the motivation for bit-width analysis is, you know, OK, you can, you can produce designs using this process, but how good are they? So this essentially kind of evolved out of, out of need. So we, we basically, we wanted to go to the printer group and say, hey, we can design things automatically that are, that are competitive with what you design by hand. And what we first found out is that if you, 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 know, you compare our design with what they had, they had you know, five-bit ALUs and they had you know, three-bit registers. And all the, we, we had 32-bit for everything. I mean, you know, C says an integer is 32 bits. Maybe eight and 16 if you allow char and half word. But you know, everything is full width where they had the, these narrow things. So what you really got to do is you need to analyze the code so that you can produce narrow hardware. So if, if you're only using five bits of precision for your, for your ad, please give me a five bit adder. Don't, don't, don't waste your time with a bigger adder. So the way we do this is we're going to, in order to, we're starting with a C-level specification. So what we want to do is we want to analyze the, the code to figure out which, vari which variables uh, what is the width of each variable that's kind of what is the necessary width for each variable and then use that to design our custom use the results of this analysis to design custom hardware. So we call this uh, process bit width analysis. And what we focus on is we focus on area and gate count. So that's kind of what we're trying, you know, how much can we save, what, how, how much can we save by doing width analysis in the area and gate count side. Um, kind of other things that are, are possibly more important but we just haven't focused on yet, you know, narrower things tend to consume less power. So a uh, five-bit adder consumes much less power than a 32-bit adder. Similarly, timing, you know, if you have like a ripple carry adder, you know, the amount of time to ripple through 32 bits is a lot more than the amount of time to ripple through five bits. So, you know, n finding out things are narrower than they should be or narrower than they're specified to be has good indirect, good effects on, on, on all these issues. So, you know, what is bit width analysis? So, in the simplest sense, what you're trying to, do is you're trying to identify the bits in a 32-bit variable that contain useful information. So if we consider this, this um, uh, the bit level view of a variable uh, at the top of the slide, what I've, what I've, the color code is that the green bits don't change when you run the program. The red bits change. 
So the green bits can have any value. They can be, you know, one, zero, one, zero, one, but they're fixed. They never change during the execution, whereas the red ones are the ones that are changing. So ideally, what did, with analysis, what I want to do, it, was, it would want to identify the red bits. So in this case, I have an 8-bit value. Now, we've made a couple simplifying assumptions for, for our analysis. The first is that we're going to identify the leading bit that contains use, useful information. So in this case, we want to identify bit 23. And what we're going to do is we're going to say this is the 24-bit quantity. So everything below the leading bit is just assumed to have uh, useful information in it. The second thing is what is a useless bit? So in the most general sense, it's just a bit that doesn't change. However, we've specialized it to be, it's always, it's essentially the assigned bit. So for an unsigned uh, variable, a useless bit is always zero. It's hardwired to be zero. For a signed quantity, it's equal to the signed bit. So essentially, you can all, if you have a narrow quantity, you can always sign extend it to get to a wider quantity. Now, in, some, in the experiments, I'm going to show you, you know, what are the, at least for the, uh, the leading bit, you know, what, what were the, uh, implications of these assumptions. How, how much were we leaving on the table by making these simplifying assumptions? Okay, so the, the traditional approach to width analysis is kind of goes hand in hand with hand design. So I call it declarative width analysis. So here the, the user's writing the hardware description language. So the user says I want a five bit adder, a three bit multiplier. The user does all this and possibly the, you know, there's some hidden latches that the synthesis tool is going to take care of and, and size for you properly. What, what we do is uh, what I call semantic width analysis. So here we want to understand the program. This operation talks to this operation. It doesn't talk to any of these guys. The difference between an add and a multiply. So essentially you want to understand who's talking to who, what, op what kind of functionality various operations are having, and then derive the minimal widths required to achieve proper execution. So proper execution is essentially run the code with full width, write down the output. Run the code with narrow width, it better be the same as the, as the wide width. So any kind of narrowing down that you can do to maintain the same output I is considered you know, a correct thing to do. Yes, in the back. Uh, question on that. How do you, so that's sort of, you, you run some cases and see what changes, but how do you verify that that in fact is the correct size for whatever, they, for the general data case? I mean, how do you verify that, um, that you made the, the right guess? Yeah, so what we're actually going to do, the, the stuff I'm going to talk about is static analysis. So we're essentially going to guarantee that for all inputs, this is true. However, I'm, there's another a profile based approach where you, is essentially, yeah, you, for, a new, for a particular input, this is valid. But our analysis is all static based, so it's, it's valid for all inputs. Yeah, because you have to be, so in that, it does cause some levels of conservatism because it has to be valid for all inputs. Yeah. If I allowed the notion of correctness to not be exact, like if I'm doing lossy compression, I'm interested in the signal to noise instead of the exact answer, is that something that could fit into your type of analysis, or does it have to be exact? Or that's kind of one of the areas of, of future work. I mean, I think right now the analysis is it has to be exact, that nothing can be incorrect. Essentially what you're talking about is some level of statistical width analysis. If I can, if I can be within some you know, fraction, some, some percentage of what the correct output is, could be, then I could actually narrow my width further. Um, yeah, we haven't gotten into that. There's actually some, I was at CMU a few weeks ago and they're actually looking at that for floating point. So essentially, you know, can I narrow my mantis and my exponent as long as it doesn't change my precision by a whole lot. So I think that's an, inter an interesting way to extend this, uh, to get into, you know, further narrow. Like if you're viewing an image and you're viewing a second image which is slightly different, you may not be able to tell the difference, but I may need a lot fewer bits to generate this one than I do this one. So it, it's a pretty good area to get into. Um, did you have a question, Susan? Or? I'll save it until a little bit later. Okay. Okay, so what's the basic idea of, uh, of width analysis? So the, so instead of focusing on the, the whole program, let's kind of zoom in on one operation. So C equals one assembly level operation. So C equals A plus B. So there's really three things that determine the width uh, of this operation. So if we look at the top, the amount of information flowing in determines how much useful information I can produce on the output. So if I only have three bits of data flowing in, I can't produce a 32-bit value. Add just doesn't create that many bits. So you're limited by how much you have coming in as to how much you can produce. Now on the output side, you know, look at my, look at who's going to use this value. If these guys only need, say, five and six bits, don't, don't produce 32 bits because don't, don't produce more than you need to. So only produce what's required by the, by the consumers. And then the third component is this add. So given that I know something about A and B, the semantics of add tell me something about C. And similarly, if I know something about C, the semantics of add tell me something about A and B. So we're going to use these three things 
to derive what is the width of the, of the variables in, in an in overall program. Okay, so let's focus first on the, the opcode. So for the purposes of this, of this talk, I'm gonna assume that there's only one opcode in the universe and that's called integer add. Nothing else exists, so please bear with me. I mean, generally what you have to do is you have to apply this analysis for every opcode uh, in, in the space. So multiply, divide, and shift, whatever. You have to do this for all these opcodes. But let's just go through it for add for now. <coughs> so we start with our C equals A plus B. And let's assume that A, its value ranges from minus capital A to positive capital A minus one. So that's the value of A. So using two's complement, what you can show is that the, the width of A is the ceiling, the log base two, of, a, of capital A, that whole thing plus one. So that's how many bits in two's complement it is required to represent this value range. Okay, so we're gonna apply the same arguments to A and B. Okay, so, or, yeah, to, to B and C, I'm sorry. So the forward transfer function, what that's trying to do is, given I know uh, information about A and B, what can I say about C? So essentially what you have to do is you have to do a worst case analysis. So what's the worst case for C? So the worst case is I'm gonna add either the two most negative numbers together or the two biggest positive numbers together. That's, how, that's the worst case for C. So that's essentially what this line says right here. It says that my worst case is either negative the quantity A plus B or the quantity A plus B minus two. So these are the, 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 the two extremes that I can get uh, for, this, for this case. So now if you express this range in two's complement, what you see is that it's the ceiling, that should be log two, the quantity A plus B, that whole thing plus one. So that's how many bits in two's complement are required to represent this range uh, yeah, as shown right there. So then you can do some clever mathematics and what you can show is that the width of C is constrained to be the maximum of the two input widths plus one. So what, the, what this says is that if you add two eight bit numbers together, excuse me, the most you can get is nine bits on the output side. You can't get anything bigger. Everything else is just replicas of the sign bit. <coughs> okay, now on the backward side, what we're gonna say is Given that we know something about C, what can we say about A and B? So again, we're gonna look at the worst case. So what's the worst case? The worst case is that one of these guys is zero and the other guy is equal to C. So that's essentially what this is saying. So if A is zero, then B is equal to C. So what this says is that the width of A is constrained to be no bigger than the width of C and similarly the width of B is constrained to be no bigger than the width of C. So what this is saying is that if you have a nine bit output you only need to examine the lower nine, nine bits of your two inputs to derive that nine bit output. Any upper, any bits above that are, are irrelevant and you can throw away. Okay. So the way the analysis starts is that you either start with the C declared type, so A1632. Um, this is for variables. The user is allowed to specify, hey, this is an 11 bit quantity. The other source is if one of these is a literal. So in, in, if there's a literal, then, you, then it's, there's only one value. So you, you derive your information from, from these three sources uh, and then you propagate it. So A, is A a number or is the width of A? A is, an, a is a number. A is like negative 37 to positive 45. Yeah. And then the w, w sub A is the width to, to handle that range. Yes? Why can't A and B be? one positive, one negative. So for example, if I know that one is negative 128 and the other is positive 127, C is only gonna have one bit, but A and B have more bits. That's right, so this is, this, this is conservative. So this will essentially say that, you know, yeah, this will end up, yeah, you could say that C is one bit, but what it's gonna say is that C is eight bits, because you're adding an eight bit to a seven bit. So you this is a this is a backward transfer after you've done the forward transfer. <coughs> yes, you will apply the backward transfer. You'll apply essentially it's going to be an iterative process. So you can apply forward and backwards and forward and backwards and essentially until you get a convergence. But you won't know, the, the problem is you won't know the actual values of minus of of capital C and, and minus C. I mean, if you would, then it would all just be literals, and then you can come up with what you said. But so what it's saying is that yeah, you couldn't I add an eight bit to an eight bit. I'm gonna say it's a nine bit, but it may only be one bit because it could be, you know, minus, you know, minus two and positive one. So, uh, but this is essentially the, it's a worst case analysis. So what is the, what is the worst case that you can produce on your output side, given any value uh, in, in uh, a specified range? Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply 
So we're gonna apply a forward analysis where we propagate all right-hand side constraints to left-hand side. And we're gonna do this from the top of the program down to the bottom of the program. But for now, again, we're gonna still focus on a single operation. So what this is saying, so R my equals A plus B. So what we do is we look at all the definers of A and all the definers of B. So in this case, I have an 11-bit definer of A and a 13-bit definer of A. So I need, to take, I need to do a worst case. So essentially what I do is I take the max of 13 and 1. So I'm gonna assume for the purposes of this iteration that the width of A is 13. So that's essentially what this thing is saying is that the width of each source, I look at all the definers and it's the max of those definers. So essentially the width of A is 13, the width of B is the max of three and four, four. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply the forward transfer function. So the forward transfer function says that the width of C is no bigger than the max of the two inputs plus one. So the max of 13 and four is 13, add one, 14. So C is no bigger than 14 bits. I compare that to what I knew before. So I knew before that C was 32 bits. I didn't really know anything about it. So 14 is smaller than 32. So I kind of, now I've, now I've kind of established that C is no bigger than 14. So what you can see is it's kind of an iterative constraint uh, propagation system where you, you, each time you try to establish a, a new lesser number for width than you had previously established. And if you do establish it, and if, and if the new width is smaller than the old width, then you essentially substitute, and you always go in this unidirectional fashion of always lowering widths. Okay, so now let's look at the backward side. So the backward side, we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at the uses of C. So in this case, th there's two users of C. One guy needs seven bits, one guy needs nine bits. So I gotta, again, take the worst case. So that's what this statement is saying. Take the worst case of all my consumers, that's how many bits I gotta produce. So in this case, I gotta produce nine bits here. So if I'm producing nine bits, what, what does that constrain my inputs to be? So now we're gonna apply the backward transfer function. So the backward transfer function says that if I know C is nine bits, A needs to be no more than nine bits, B needs to be no more than nine bits. So we previously had established that A was 13. So nine is smaller than 13, so now I have a new constraint on A. A is now no more than nine bits. Now B I had previously established was four bits. So saying it's no more than nine doesn't give me any new information. So we leave B alone as it had a previously had established a, a smaller width. So A is, after this step, A is nine and B is left as four. That's right, these are, these are, so when you get up to the definition of A, it's kind of going to be like the definition for C. So you're going to, yeah, you're going to take the worst case of the consumers of A in order to, uh, but what this is trying to establish, this is trying to establish a, um, well, let me go, let me talk about it in the, in the next, it's essentially, for this instance of A, what's the width? And there may be multiple instances of A, in which case you have to take the, the worst case. Uh, but for this instance of A, it needs to be no more than nine bits. If I have another consumer that's 10 bits, then the producer is really gonna have to produce 10. Yeah, there's another question. Did you, did you say that A and B have to be positive or negative? Uh, no, A and B can be positive or negative. So it's, yeah, two's complement. Uh, it seems that if one of them can be very large, then the other one has to be large. Even if the result is negative, it's nine bits. Can you say that again? I didn't hear what you said. You could have a very large positive number. Yeah. Have Yes, so in, in that case, it'll over-specify the width of the output because it won't assume, it won't, it, yeah, it won't take advantage of the fact that it's a big positive and a big negative. Unless there's some, liter if there's some literals involved, then it could take advantage. But if these are just variables and they just happen to be big positive, big negative, then it's gonna say C is big, when in, in reality C is maybe one bit or two bits. So the analysis is gonna be conservative uh, in that case. So, uh, yeah, I, I'll have some experiments to show you how conservative that, that really is. Okay, so let's, boy, I'm running low on time here. Um, let's kind of quickly fly through this example. So now, instead of examining a single operation at a time, let's examine a few operations together. And like I said, I only know about ads. So this is kind of a contrived example of just ads, but please bear with me. So what we have is we have two statements, I1 and I2. Then we have a loop that loops an indeterminate number of times with one statement in it. And then we have a statement after the loop. And what the kind of the initial state of my algorithm is, is that uh, these are the widths uh, at my initial state. And generally what we require is that the user has said something about the values that are live in and the values that are live out. So essentially, like for example, A, A is read from some file somewhere and you know, stuck into A. 
So unless the user tells me something about the characteristics of A, I have to assume 32 bits. Because I can't, I'm not data dependent, so I, I can't go look in that file. So essentially the, the, the way we set up this system is that anything that's defined externally or used externally, the user has told me how big that, that variable is. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do first pass of forward propagation. So we're gonna propagate right hand side to left hand side. So what we do is we initialize all the live in variables to what the width was here. Everything else we set to this bottom or unknown uh, state. So what we do then, so to figure out the width of x, we're gonna apply the forward transfer function. So the max of three and 11 is 11, plus one is 12. So we conclude that x is 12 bits wide. We go down to the next statement and prop, so the only definition which reaches this x is this one. So this guy's width is 12. Then we apply the forward transfer function. The max of these two plus one, we end up with 13. Now an interesting case comes with y. So we're trying to figure out the width of this y. Well, this definition reaches, the definition from I2, and there's also a loop here, so the definition of I3 reaches. So the first time through, we're gonna take the max of, we've established that this definition is 13 bits, but this guy's still unknown. So the max of 13 and unknown is 13. So that's how we establish that the width of y here is 13. Max, then we apply the forward transfer function. The max of these two plus one, 14 bits. Now we can propagate through to I4, and I'll, I'll skip that for a minute. But now we, we, have to iter we essentially have to keep iterating this process until we stabilize. So because of this loop, now when we look at this use of Y, we have the 13-bit definition reaching it. We also have the back edge or the 14-bit definition reaching it. So that's where this, so the max of 13 and 14, we end up with 14. Max of the two plus one, 15. So essentially you're gonna keep iterating this process. And because this loop could iterate any, we don't know how many times it can iterate, you, you have to have 32 bits to represent y. So that's essentially, so in the first pass through this algorithm, it's reduced the uh, values for this x and this y from 32 to 12 and 13. But for the rest of the code, it hasn't done anything because it can't reach as anything. So this is the first forward pass of the algorithm. So it's essentially affected statements one and two, but statements three and four have had no changes uh, after this process. Okay, so now we're gonna do backward analysis. So this is what we got on the previous slide. These are the results. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna initialize all the live outs to whatever their currently established width is. And then we're gonna an initialize everything else to unknown. And we're gonna propagate backwards. So propagating backwards is very simple. So what, what this says is that given that I know Z is 16, I know that Y and C need to be no more than 16 bits. So essentially you just propagate the, the width to the right. So it's kind of interesting that C was a live in variable. So C, the user said, you're gonna go to a file and read a 32 bit value. But what we've concluded is that you only need the lower 16 bits of C. So these, these live in, live out widths that the user specified is just a starting point. These aren't any kind of requirements as to, you know, thou shall be uh, 32 bits, you know, no matter what. So these are just a starting point and we're allowed to change the widths of the live ins and the live outs based on the analysis of the other operations. So you basically, you propagate the 16 backward and the I3Y is reduced to 16. However, at the upper two statements were already smaller than 16 bits, so they don't get changed. So kind of the final you know, score of the whole thing was that you know, the X and Y were reduced to uh, 12, and Y, this is coming back to the instance versus the various instances of Y. So the Y used in I2 was only 13 bits. The Y used in I3 is 16 bits. So what this is essentially saying is that if I'm gonna have one storage location for Y, I need the max of all these instances. So if I'm gonna store Y in a single register, I'm gonna need 16 bits because Y at its maximum width is 16. What it, however, what it's saying is that the communication from I2 to I3 need only be 12 bits. So essentially the, or I'm sorry, 13 bits. So essentially what the instance widths are, or the reference widths are specifying is the, is the wire widths between the various operations. Whereas the, the max of these is specifying the storage width. How many, how many bits do I need to store this value of Y for all occurrences in the program. So you can think of, you know, that, that's how we use the different uh, values for the, the reference widths versus the kind of the max of the reference widths. Okay. Um, let me, well, yeah, let me skip this actually. So there's actually, and you can ask me this uh, tomorrow or afterwards, there, there's some interesting issues associated with signed and unsigned arithmetic that I'm gonna kind of skip and not go over. So basically when you mix signed and unsigned, the transfer functions don't, initially don't hold. So what you need to do is, you, kind of like single and double precision with floating points, you need to promote to a common, a common type, do your operation, 
and then possibly transform your output type. So if you're adding a single and double, what you do is you promote the single to the double, you do your add, produce your output. And if the output was, say, single, then you convert the double down to single. Similarly, with signed and unsigned, what you're going to do is you're going to, if you have a signed and an unsigned, you're going to promote the unsigned to signed, do the, do the arithmetic, produce the signed result. If you have an unsigned, if you need unsigned, then you can down convert that to unsigned. So essentially, signed and unsigned are kind of similar to uh, uh, single and double precision. Okay, so now let, let's look at some evaluations of the width analysis and how effective it is. So, you know, I kind of come from the world where you, you focus on performance. So basically you promose, propose some new compiler optimization or some new widget that you're going to add into your processor and you say, okay, I add this new widget in, how much performance do I gain? I run spec and, okay, I get 5 or 10%, 20%, whatever. Whereas in this case what we do, the performance is pre-specified. The spacewalker is specified. So it says you will initiate a new loop iteration every, every three cycles. So that's essentially the II. So essentially the, the, the throughput-based per, uh, performance has been uh, pre-specified. And then what we're going to do is we're going to measure how big is the accelerator to implement uh, with, with those requirements. So what we do is we have a, for each component in our design, we have a gate count model. And the gate count is, is parameterized by, by width. So for example, an adder is 9.5 gates per bit. Uh, register is 10 gates per bit. Multiplier is quadratic. A mux is, is, is parameterized by both its width and number of ports. And the way we derived these was we essentially went to the HP ASIC designers and said, hey, what's a good formula for this? Or you, you design a 16, a, you know, a 32, a 16, and an 8. You draw a line, and that's how we come up with the formula. The applications that I'm going to look at are, are 12 uh, loop nets that primarily focus on image processing. And these are some of the uh, specific application domains that, that we're looking at. Okay, so the first thing is, you know, how effective is the width analysis? So what this chart plots is on the y-axis is the normalized gate count. On the x-axis is the various applications uh, with the arithmetic mean for, for all 12 applications. And I realize I think when you, when you average ratios together, you're supposed to use geometric mean or harmonic mean or something, but arithmetic mean was the only mean that I ever, that e actually um, logically ever made sense to me in terms of understanding. I mean, so that's why, <laughs> why I chose to pick that one. Okay, so what are the various bars? So the blue bar is essentially no analysis at all. It's very stupid. It says all variables are 32 bits. Even if the user said this is a char, it's still a 32-bit variable. So this is no analysis, very, very dumb. This was actually the state of our system about a year ago or a year and a half ago. So, it, so it's not as stupid as one may think. Uh, let me skip the red bar for a moment. The green bar is essentially local width analysis. So local width analysis is within a single C statement, I'm going to do forward analysis. So I'm going to propagate right-hand sides to left-hand sides. But that's all, I'm only going to go within a single C statement. And the reasons for the red, or the reasons for the green is just kind of how the software evolved. And that was kind of our, our first intermediate point for width analysis. Let me skip the yellow bar for a moment. The purple bar is essentially the full analysis over the whole, the stuff that I described in the talk over the entire program including all the various opcodes other more in addition to add. Now what the red is, if you compare the green and the red, what the red is saying is that before I'm going to do my analysis, I'm going to upconvert all variables to their nearest C width. So if I had a 7-bit variable, I'm going to say that's 8-bit and, and then do my analysis after that. So what, what the difference between the red and the green is essentially what's the benefit of specifying non-standard widths prior to the analysis. So what's the, what's the advantage of allowing the user to specify non-standard widths? Similarly, the, the purple and the yellow, before I do my global analysis, I upconvert everything to its nearest C width and then do analysis. Now the analysis can express three, six, it can express any bit width it wants, but what, the question is what is this input? With that, I'll stop. Thank you.